Okay, so there's still a few people coming through, but if we, we can get started um, just in terms of sort of sticking to sticking to the timings. Um, so good evening to everyone who is here. I think the majority of people are here now. Um, welcome to this, to this evening's webinar. Um, so this webinar is designed to give you guys a little bit more information um, about the Science at Heart School Team Prize. Um, so my name is Jolie, I'm here representing the Medic Portal um, and we're working alongside the British Heart Foundation and Imperial College to facilitate this um, and hopefully it will give you some more information about how you can excel um, when it comes to designing your poster for uh, the British Heart Foundation. Um, just a little bit about us before we sort of jump into the webinar. Um, so the Medic Portal, um, Medic Portal? The Medic Portal, even, um, are a company who are partnered with the Royal Society of Medicine. Um, so that's sort of the governing body for, for medical education. So um, we personally are dedicated to ensuring that um, we provide educational excellence for all those who are looking to apply to medical school. So we cover a wide range of subjects um, about people who are interested in pursuing a medical career. Um, but this talk isn't really about us today. Um, so today we have the pleasure of hearing from um, Professor Dorian Haskard. So um, he is in the meeting here. Um, he has an incredible wealth of scientific accolades and publications. Um, and personally, I'm very interested to hear this talk today. I actually did a um, biomedical sciences degree before I pursued my career in medicine. Um, so I'm particularly interested in, in hearing from Professor Haskard, especially um, talking about sort of academic medicine as a career and then um, moving on to talking about the, the science prize um, and giving you some top tips on how to design your posters and, um, you know, how to succeed. Um, so I will disappear now and hand over to, to Dorian for the main talk. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see, yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much. And, and, and um, it, it really is a, a, such a pleasure to be, to be here, a pleasure and privilege to be, to be here talking to you this evening. So yes, my name is Dorian Haskard and, and um, I'm a professor at, at the National Heart and Lung Institute at Imperial College. And, and I'm here really representing both the British Heart Foundation and the BHF Center of Excellence uh, in Research at Imperial College. And um, you, most of you will be aware that they were floating this uh, school prize, school team prize. And um, I certainly am going to come on to um, how, how we came up with this prize and, and what we're expecting from it. But first, I think that uh, a word or two of introduction about academic medicine is, 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 is worthwhile because I think at the end of the day, what we're really interested in is, is for um, young people to, to come into medicine with, with an academic frame of mind uh, to meet tomorrow's challenges. So I've, I've called the talk Academic Medicine, Whence and Where To. Well, I have to admit that, that uh, when people ask me at a party or whatever, you know, what do I do? And I say, I'm in academic medicine. Uh, most people don't have a clue what that means. And, and I guess finding a definition of it uh, is not terribly easy. I, I went, oh, before we get onto that, uh, just to give you a, a, a synopsis of how we're gonna do this. So first of all, I'm gonna talk a bit about what is academic medicine. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some, some just examples of scientific trends that I think are super relevant to the future of medicine. Um, I'm gonna spend a few, a minute or two to talk about how you enter academic medicine uh, and stay in it, working in it. Then we're going to spotlight on the heart and circulation, which is our field. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to get on to introducing the Imperial BHF Science at Heart School Team Prize. So bear with me uh, when it comes to the prize. So what is academic medicine? Well, I went to the dictionaries and this is what I found. Academic medicine is a branch of medicine pursued by doctors who engage in a variety of scholarly activities. Well, I didn't think that was that promising and, and, and it brought to mind Rembrandt's picture of a scholar at his desk in the 1600s. And actually this is exactly what a doctor would have been doing in the 1600s, because in those days uh, there was no science behind medicine and science was entirely based on theory and book learning 
and they went into enormous discussions and uh, digressions uh, on uh, basically stuff that was inherited from the Greeks and the Romans. But all changed really. I think that the change that uh, the person who, who many people feel is the start of academic medicine, even though himself he wasn't an academic, uh, was Thomas Sydenham, who, who has come to be known as the English Hippocrates. And, and this is after, um, of course, the Greek Hippocrates, the great teacher uh, who handed down so many aphorisms uh, uh, about, about medicine. So um, just I'd give a little story about Sydenham first before we go on. So he was an incredibly interesting man. And, and Sydenham was uh, brought up in Dorset. His, his, his father was a farmer, he came from farming stock, and he was sent up to Oxford age 18 to, to study. But no sooner had he got there uh, than the English Civil War broke out. His, his parents were, were Puritans, uh, and um, they all fell in with the rebel parliamentary army. And, and uh, Sydenham was a, a soldier in that. And, and eventually, of course, the parliamentarians won the war. Uh, and, and Sydenham came back, studied medicine, and came up to London, where he became a doctor. Uh, and he retained his rebellious approach uh, by advocating, instead of the theories and ancient texts, he actually advocated practical medicine based on what could be learned from patients. So he, he, he himself uh, made great strides in understanding fevers, and he was able to categorize uh, the patterns of common fevers particularly actually malaria, which, which, which was uh, at that time present in, in, in the southeast of London, uh, and which of course has a periodic fever, you get a fever every four or five days. Uh, and he introduced the use of Jesuit bark, so-called because the Jesuits brought it back from South America. And of course, this was later found to be, to contain quinine, which was highly effective at treating malaria. Now I said that uh, uh, Sydney wasn't himself uh, a university guy particularly, he had a university degree, but uh, he, he, never he never did much at the Royal College of, of, of Physicians because uh, he refused to speculate and he upheld the Enlightenment scientific tenets of the Royal Society, which in turn were based on Francis Bacon's belief that evidence had to be the basis of what we know. So Sydenham really is the origin of what we now call evidence-based medicine, which is the core of how we practice medicine. Well, moving on from Sydenham and looking at a chronology then of, of uh, how medicine was developed. I mean, clearly to, in one slide to encompass a vast subject is, is impossible. Just to give you a feel of how, uh, obviously medicine, as I said, depends on science and science depends on, on evidence. And evidence in turn depends on the technology to obtain it. Uh, and so uh, these disciplines, which gradually emerged in, in, in the course of of, of the years of medicine, uh, physiology and pharmacology in the late 1800s, biochemistry, diagnostic radiology, we'll come on to that, and virology in the early 1900s. These by and large were based on, on, on two major technical arenas. One was microscopy and improved, improving ways to see what was very small, uh, and chemistry. Uh, chemistry being the basically the underlying discipline uh, up to, I would say, the, uh, the mid 1900s. But then everything changed uh, because what happened was computers. So uh, in my, during my working time, computers have made an absolutely vast difference and will continue to do so. So I'm going to give you uh, five examples then of, of how computers are shaping the future uh, of medicine. This, this may seem obvious in, in general, but I'm going to give you five specifics that hopefully will excite you about uh, the future, what can, come, uh, what can now be done. So the first is in, in the field of molecular biology, DNA technology, uh, and molecular genetics. So if, you, if we go back to 1953, this is when um, Maurice Wilkins, James Watson, and Francis Crick uh, discovered the double helix structure of DNA, uh, for which they got the Nobel Prize in 1962. A actually, there was a woman behind all these men, uh, and that was Rosalind Franklin, who, who provided the photograph. She was a crystallographer a viral crystallographer, and, and she provided a photograph of an uh, X-ray diffraction uh, image that um, uh, clearly showed uh, um, that the uh, nucleic acid in the virus was a double helix. Um, and certainly, and this was hugely influential to, to Wilkins, Watson, and Crick, and she really should have won the Nobel Prize with them. The problem was she died, and she tragically died of cancer uh, in 1957. 
uh, and so wasn't eligible uh, to be given the Nobel Prize because it can't be given posthumously. So fast forward 47 years, uh, 2000 and the millennium, and we saw the full sequencing of one human genome. So this is the uh, one, the chromosomes from one individual were sequenced. It took 13 years and it cost about a billion pounds to do this. And such is the pace of technology that 21 years later today, this can be done in 24 hours, not 13 years, 24 hours. And it doesn't cost a billion pounds, it costs roughly 4,000 pounds and dropping. So the, the, the consequence of this is that we now have ways of, of creating big data sets. Large scale population studies uh, allow the assembly of big data using computers that can link genetics to lifestyle and the environment uh, in uh, allowing us to understand much better about disease and about, uh, about uh, successful and unsuccessful responses to treatment. And, and there are several cohorts uh, around. I'll give you two examples here. One is the UK Biobank, which between 2006 and 2010, recruited about half a million uh, healthy participants and is following those uh, indefinitely uh, to relate genetics and environment to eventual uh, disease. And then the other is the NHS, uh, National Institute of Health Research, 100,000 genome study, which is doing similar things with hospital patients. So computers are not only important for medicine in, in, in crunching big data, but they actually provide the way of obtaining data. So, so um, this is the second example, which actually comes from, um, in large part from a company called Latimetrics, who I think was Silicon Valley based. Uh, and, and they devised these chips, uh, one for the human and one for the mouse. Uh, you can see that the, the size there, the size of a matchstick. Uh, and these, if you put a sample on these, uh, it actually can tell you the full, uh, the full um, expression of, of, uh, of whatever genes are expressed in that sample. So this led to the word genomics. Now, genomics is basically, is, uh, omics is a suffix on any, on any, any noun that indicates totality. So uh, the uh, sample going on the chip provides the totality of gene expression in that sample. So this whole concept extended, has extended enormously to what we now call omics technology, which for other examples, you can do proteins, we can do lipids, uh, sugars, metabolites, uh, and it can be done at the organ level, one can take cell populations, and one can even get omic data from a single cell. So it's possible to know the full gene expression uh, in just in one cell, which is truly remarkable. So this has had an absolutely fundamental effect on, on how we think about and how we study biology. So before omics technology, uh, we were all trained to take a reductionist approach uh, with an emphasis on a pre-existing hypothesis. So that would basically involve studying at one protein or one gene uh, and knowing all about it, uh, and then uh, trying to figure out what it all meant. After omics, we've got unbiased systems approach with an emphasis on not, uh, not proving or disproving a hypothesis, but actually finding a hypothesis. So it's, it's, it's a much, much more powerful approach to, to, to biology where we're not applying our preconceptions but we're asking this technology to come up with the hypothesis for us, which we can then test with the reductionist experiments. Moving on to the third example then, this is physics and imaging technology. And, and this is a lady who actually did win the Nobel Prize, Marie Curie. She was the first lady, first woman to win the Nobel Prize. And I think the only woman to win it twice. So she won it first uh, with her husband, Pierre, uh, for uh, coming up with the concept of radiation and radioactivity. Uh, and then she, after her husband died, she won it for discovering plutonium and radium uh, uh, as radioactive elements. So actually during that, she, she lived in, she was Polish, but she lived in Paris. And during the First World War, she actually, um, she, she, I should say also that she, she didn't discover x-rays, but she was very instrumental in their application. And during the First World War, uh, she devised a whole system of mobile x-ray units. Here is her driving one, which went out to the front uh, and enabled field doctors to actually take x-rays of battle casualties 
to see actually what the problem was. Uh, and this would be an example of, of such an X-ray. And you can see it, it's a very, uh, by today's standards, it's, 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 it's very crude, but you can see there the bullet uh, in the heart. But of course, imaging has changed massively since 1915. Uh, and there is what we can do now with the heart. So this is thanks to my colleague, Declan O'Regan. Um, and it's a cine cardiac magnetic resonance image, uh, which is in, in, in potentially in four dimensions, only three here, it's, it's two dimensions and, and time. And you can see uh, the blood is entering the right atrium through the right ventricle, uh, back to the lungs, left atrium and left ventricle. And this gives a huge amount of information about blood flow, uh, uh, about the capacity of the heart to pump, about the walls of the heart, and it can also tell you about the coronary arteries. So amazingly precise imaging capacity. And, and this is just one modality uh, of many ways in which we can now look at the human body without taking it to bits. This is being exploited then by UK Biobank, which I mentioned earlier. So of those half a million participants, 100,000 are in a sub-study where they're being uh, so they're participating in a very detailed imaging program of brain, heart, and, and, and abdomen with MR, dual X-ray, dual energy X-rays for looking at bone density and potential for osteoporosis, and then carotid ultrasound for arterial disease, which I'm going to come on to. So you have an unprecedented large-scale imaging study to identify associations between lifestyle and genetic factors and imaging-derived phenotypes. The fourth example then is, 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 is relates to remote medicine. Uh, now, we all know a bit about re remote medicine these days, somewhat to our cost, because it's in, almost impossible to, to go and see one's GP. Uh, and uh, because of COVID, everything now has to be done remotely, sometimes on the telephone or Zoom or Teams. Um, and I think we're all learning a new way to deliver medicine. Um, and of course, we want to avoid that being the only way of delivering medicine because the, the patient contact between doctor and patient is immensely important. But um, I want to just mention um, this, the, the Internet of Things, which, which this, this basically means the interconnection via the Internet uh, of computing devices embedded in everyday objects, enabling them to receive and to send data. And so this would be an example where uh, 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 sensing devices are embedded in the house. They can pick up behavior, sleep patterns, medication potentially, uh, and um, uh, potentially EEG for epileptics. This can all be signaled into a cloud. AI machine learning can crunch the data, send it down, and that can then be delivered uh, to doctors and other healthcare professionals uh, who can make a decision on, on what needs to be done. And, and as an example, Let's look at what might be done for uh, an elderly person living alone, uh, susceptible to picking up uh, infections. Um, so here the Internet of Things is picking up uh, um, the movement of an individual around the house. You can see the, the arrows and can come up with then a, a grid. Uh, uh, this is on the Y axis. We've got the time and then the different rooms that person has been spending uh, his or her time in. And you can see that under healthy circumstances, that individual spending most of the time in the living room. But here things have changed. And what's been detected uh, is that actually it's so much more in the bathroom. And it turns out that of course, this individual has a urinary tract infection, which is one of the most common causes for elderly people to have to go to hospital. So this biometric data can detect UTIs, uh, home diagnosis, early treatment, uh, and can avoid, uh, can treat early uh, and avoid hospital admissions. But you can see that this could be applied to all sorts of stuff. And I'd certainly want you to think about this uh, if you're in, in coming up with a new poster about cardiovascular medicine. So the fifth example then uh, relates to the cost of medicines and, and, and healthcare in general. Uh, and um, we can see here that over the course of the last 10 years or so, Actually, the, 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 the British uh, expenditure on health has remained pretty flat at 10% GDP. In America, it's, con it's continuing to climb. Uh, this 10% is not going to last. We're going to have to be spending more on, 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 on health care. Um, obviously, there are differences between countries. I, I can't get into that now, but that's an interesting subject in itself. Um, but 
the, the point being that this is a massive amount to spend on health and we can't allow it to, we want to avoid it getting more. Now, one of the reasons why healthcare is so expensive is the cost of drugs. And the reason that uh, drugs are so expensive, or is one of the reasons, is because is the huge cost of developing a new drug. Uh, because the attrition from compounds that go into a drug discovery program through preclinical work, through clinical trials, may lead to uh, success of one approved drug at, in the chemist shop at the end of the day, of one in, between one in 5,000 to one in 10,000. And so it's reckoned that it costs in the order of, of a billion pounds to develop a new drug. Now, if we could find ways of doing this, uh, developing drugs uh, more cheaply and more efficiently uh, for the right people and for people who are not going to get side effects, that is surely going to reduce the cost of, of, of developing of drug development. Uh, so this brings us to the whole concept of personalized medicine. This is a buzzword at the moment in medicine. But basically, it's the idea that you can link all this genetic imaging and remote monitoring data uh, with big science, big data science, to allow clinical trials to, to actually target the most likely beneficiaries uh, of a new drug uh, at, at reduced risk and, and reduced cost. Well, I've given you five examples of pretty high-tech stuff, and, and I really don't want you to go away from this webinar thinking that medicine is all about that, because really there are some very essential considerations for applying all these new developments uh, to, to, to medicine. The first is that obviously prevention is better than cure. We, we've got to find ways of preventing disease uh, rather than waiting till uh, the last minute and then curing it at greater expense and greater inconvenience and discomfort to patients. Well, one way to prevent disease is, is to attend to environmental factors. And with these have to be factored in. Uh, there's obviously a huge environmental, it can't be, it can't be overstated the environmental influence on, on illness and disease. And we all know that, that poverty and deprivation and social conditions are immensely important. And, and so uh, the social sciences have to partner up with medicine uh, to allow us to move forward effectively. And then lastly, what I call the three A's, uh, new developments in medicine have to be acceptable. And we'll come on to this when we, when we, uh, a bit later. Uh, they have to be available. So there's no point creating a wonder drug if no one can have it. Uh, and related to that, they need to be affordable. So there's no point creating a drug that's going to be potentially take, taken by a million people if that drug is going to cost £100,000 a year each. It's just not going to be possible. So, so there has, there's a huge imperative uh, to look for. Um, I think to say cheaper it, it implies some sort of loss of quality. I don't mean that at all. I, I'm, I mean affordable. So the three roles in medicine then, if you come into medicine and, or medical science, or, or the medical world is obviously clinical care, which is, is the top of uh, the most important thing. But this is underpinned by research, has to be underpinned research. Go back to, uh, by research, if you go back to Thomas Sydenham, uh, we have to have the evidence uh, from clinical trials and so on uh, to underpin what we do clinically uh, with patients. And there has to be teaching. So obviously there has to be teaching of the people who deliver healthcare, but equally well, uh, people who receive healthcare or may, who may receive healthcare uh, have to be effectively taught. And, and that's where um, public and patient engagement uh, is so important for uh, doctors and nurses uh, and other healthcare people. Now, uh, there's a dimension then between those that are purely involved in, in, in clinical work and those that are purely involved in academic work. By and large, uh, clinical uh, people working in the clinic are either working in hospital trusts or in general practices, uh, and those that do academic work are usually affiliated to a university. But actually relatively few doctors in the university, uh, and this actually is a minority of doc all doctors, but of those doctors who work in universities, very few of them are not doing any clinical work. So pure clinical work is quite rare. So let's just think about how you get into uh, academic medicine. Um, well, the first thing is that you have to be, uh, if you want to be a clinically qualified medical academic, you've got to attain your clinical qualifications. And, and by now you probably all know about this. So you have to go to medical school, that take five years. 
And then there's going to be a period of post-medical school clinical training, may take up to nine years. Uh, and then you enter your clinical career as a consultant specialist or, or as a general practitioner. Now, if you want to add research into all that, um, basically there's a separate track. You have to do a, a, a university degree, a science degree. Uh, this is take, usually takes a year and, and it's embedded in the five years uh, uh, spent in, 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 in med, to make six at, at medical school. And then at some stage during clinical training, it's not, it doesn't, it's not definite at what point that would be, it's quite flexible, uh, uh, that you need to take three years out to do a PhD. Uh, and then postdoctoral scientific training, which again might take two to nine years, and eventually you end up as an academic career post and climb the academic ladder, lecturer, senior lecturer, reader, and professor. Now, in reality, these are not totally separate. So they're all interacting, and, and a, a clinically qualified medical academic has to integrate all this and basically do it together. And, and there are now good ways to do that. It's not, it's not uh, a road to discovery to work out this track. Uh, the track exists, but it's certainly hard work. Now, I, I do want to emphasize that you don't have to be clinically qualified uh, to work as a, as a medical academic. And there are many, many, many uh, effective scientists working and doing brilliant things who, who are not uh, seeing patients and not medically qualified. So to, to get into uh, medical academia uh, with purely scientific training, you do three years at university, you do a master's degree for a year, three years of the PhD, then the postdoctoral training, uh, and so on. And of course, it is possible after, you, after you've done your three years at university to then hop as a graduate entry in, into medical school. So uh, you now know how to become a medical academic. It sounds easy. Uh, it's, it's a hard road, but becoming a doctor is a hard road. But let's now spotlight on the heart of the circulation. Um, we'll start really in, in 1717, and this is George Frederick Handel presenting his first con the first uh, hearing of his water music to George I on the River Thames in actually the 17th of July, 1717. Now that same year, uh, the, uh, in fact, every year in those days uh, was published, uh, what by today's standards is completely primitive uh, epidemiological data on what people were dying of. So this is what people died of during the course of, uh, in London, I think, over the course of 1717. Uh, and some of it's quite quaint. I mean, some of it's pretty obvious. Uh, 2011 individuals died of just being aged, because of course diagnostic uh, capabilities were ex extremely meager in those days. Um, some of it was, uh, we don't even know, I mean, rising of the lights. Actually, rising of the lights uh, was, was a condition which today we call water brush or gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, and um, actually it was treated uh, rather quaintly by, by giving people lead shot uh, to drink, uh, to, to hold, hold down the, the, the reflux. But the, the by and large, the major way pe people died in those days was from infectious diseases. Uh, look at smallpox, 2, uh, 2,211 individuals dying of smallpox. And then we got French pox. This probably meant syphilis. I think the English didn't like to admit that it was Eng an English disease. Uh, consumption, hugely, that would be tuberculosis by and large. But anyway, the bottom line is that infections ruled the day, uh, and that's what people died of. So here's 1717 with the arrow, and this is the population expansion. And you can see after this point, I think uh, people, uh, the population expanded uh, very dramatically. And for the population to expand, basically it means that live births have to exceed deaths. Uh, and this, this expansion of population can be attributed uh, certainly to medicine and the cure of disease, but actually we, we can't take all the glory because food supply and the prevention for starvation is extremely important. Uh, sanitation and the prevention of infections by clean water, immensely important. And then improvements in pregnancy, childbirth uh, and infant care. The consequence of this population expansion is that people live longer. Uh, so this shows you um, basically the drop off in, uh, it, it's a survival curve. So 100% is 100% of live births at, at age naught, uh, everyone's alive, uh, but you see the drop off as people get older. And, and what you can see from 1850 to 2010 
is that 50% uh, of the population live 43 years longer. So they're not dying of infections, but they're still susceptible to illness. And of course, the, uh, so the communicable diseases are dropping off. Uh, I mean, we have to, this, this doesn't account for COVID, but actually in the bigger scheme of things, the deaths from COVID have probably not been that great in proportion to everything else. Uh, but the non-communicable diseases are what people are starting to get, and often several of them. So these are the diseases uh, that one gets when one's older. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, the, some of the main players are cardiovascular diseases. So ischemic heart disease uh, and cerebrovascular disease, which I'm going to talk about a little more, uh, have gone uh, over the last uh, 30 years uh, up to ischemic heart disease now being the, the world's most, the, the biggest uh, burden of disease uh, in the world, immensely important for medicine. Well, let's have a look at ischemic heart disease then and, 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 and just reflect on what that is. So I'm going to show you a video of, of um, a bicycling event. In, this is the, uh, the Mall in London, uh, and it's the finish of the bicycling event. And uh, so a year or two ago, and you can see what happens. So that, that guy's just come into the finishing line, and then this bicycle is coming along and just about to finish when all does not go well. And, and uh, obviously some people thought he was just tired and fainted or something, but the reality was that uh, he'd had a heart attack. Uh, luckily, he, he, he was uh, resuscitated and he came to the hospital where my colleague, Dr. Ramsey Camus, treated him in the catheter lab and uh, fed a, 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 a catheter into, his, into the arteries around his heart and, and injected dye. So this is a cardiac angiogram, coronary angiogram. And what you see is that in, in, in this vessel down here, that actually there's, there's, a, there's a block. So the, the, the blood is not properly getting down the artery. Now actually, um, during this procedure, it was possible to, dis, uh, it's due to a, a blood clot, it was possible to dislodge the blood clot uh, and to blow up with a balloon the, the narrowed vessel. And, and I'm very pleased to report that this patient did well and went home but that is not always the case. So this, this would be a similar individual who has heart who, who sadly didn't make it. And, and you can see here, this is the left anterior descending of artery that surrounds the heart, feeding the myocardial, the, the, the heart muscle. And you can see there the, the blood clot. And the consequence of that blood clot is that uh, downstream, uh, the area of muscle that is being supplied by that artery is no longer getting enough blood. Uh, and you end up with death of the heart muscle. Uh, uh, or called, and this is, this is called myocardial infarction. Infarction meaning basically cell death. Uh, uh, obviously, this comes from a, a, an individual that died. But uh, if that individual had not died, uh, this, this dead heart muscle would, the implication of this is it leads to serious loss of function of the heart. So the heart can't pump effectively because there's not enough muscle. And that ends up in a condition called heart failure, where the, the demands of the tissue are not met by the pump action of the heart. So the reason for, for, for this arterial problem is a condition called atherosclerosis. Uh, and this is the most common disease of arteries. And the risk factors include many things you will have heard of, such as high blood cholesterol, very importantly smoking, obesity and consequent diabetes, male gender, family history, but many other things, including the genetic background, environmental factors, and so on. Now, I'll just show you briefly what happens then in the artery. Uh, so this is a cross-section of a coronary artery, uh, and white blood cells stick to the sides of the, of the inner, inner lining of the, of, of the artery, and they come into the artery, and what they do is, is that they start trying to hoover up uh, cholesterol-laden fat, laid, fats are deposited in the wall of the artery. And they're trying to do a good job, but unfortunately, many of them die in the process. And, and you end up with a sort of necrotic gruel or porridge-like affair uh, that we call the necrotic core. The tissue reacts to that uh, and, you end, and, and creates a fibrous cap made from these smooth muscle cells that migrate and cover this little core. It's like a sterile abscess. Um, and that's all fine. That's, not, that's going to be perfectly asymptomatic. And many people are walking around with arteries looking a bit like this. Um, but, but unfortunately, uh, when under stress conditions and 
other things that may may cause it, infections and so on, you can this cap may break and you get fracture of the cap and the clotting system of the blood comes in contact with the necrotic core and that leads to a blood clot and thrombosis and potentially occlusion of the artery, which is what happened in that heart I showed you. So the consequences of atherosclerosis then are, are coronary thrombosis or blood clot, which may lead to sudden death. Um, uh, it may not lead to sudden death, but the consequent you may end up with a condition called an angina pectoris, which is pain in the chest when, when you take exercise and increase the demands of, on the heart, or heart failure because you've lost that cardiac muscle. And then similar things are supplying the arteries to the brain, stroke due to impaired blood supply to the brain, or impaired blood supply to the legs, leading to pains on walking uh, due to poor, poor supply of blood again, uh, and this may progress to gangrene in the feet. So it's a very serious and very common condition. What can we do about it? Well, um, we can do quite a lot. So people can adjust their lifestyle, they can take more exercise, reduce their stress, eat more healthily. Very importantly, they need to stop smoking. And then there's, not, there's various drugs that can be used. I'm not gonna get into, to, to get into them in any detail, other than just to mention statins, which I'm sure you've heard of, uh, to lower cholesterol. And then if drugs fail, there are catheter-based uh, surgical interventions. And, and these actually have done pretty well. This strategy is, has worked. And, and you can see here that, again, we're comparing the UK with the USA, and the red is the UK. And there's been a steady drop in deaths due to circulatory disease uh, from 2001 to 2016. Uh, likewise in the US, but it's plateaued out in the US, and I think it's plateauing out in the UK. So more to be done. We, how is it that we can actually get this down to the bottom? Uh, we're, we're winning, but we certainly not won. Uh, and um, more, more needs to, more research needs to happen. So this is where the British Heart Foundation comes in. The government does supply, that does uh, fund research into heart disease through the Medical Research Council and through the NHS. But the, heart, the British Heart Foundation is a, is a hugely important charity uh, that annually spends nearly a hundred million pounds uh, on research into heart disease. And one of the uh, ways in which it, 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 it funds research is, is through uh, the creation of centers of excellence in universities. Uh, currently there are six. Um, I work at Imperial College. Uh, there's King's College in London, Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, and, and Glasgow. So as part of the uh, BHF center at Imperial, um, we basically came up with this idea that it would be very interesting to float a Science at Heart School team prize. Uh, and the thinking behind this really is, 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 is just to try and get some vision and, and ideas on how we might, um, how we might uh, reduce um, deaths and disabilities caused by heart and circulatory disease uh, in the future along the lines of the technical possibilities that I've outlined here. So how can we use all these breakthroughs and developments in science and engineering to, uh, to make a difference to patients? Now, th there's two particular nuances uh, of this competition that, that, that um, it's gonna be a poster competition rather than an essay. And it's a poster competition really for two reasons. The first is that we're very attracted to, to this being a team effort rather than an, an individual effort. So we need leaders, we need role models. Uh, and we need, we need goal scorers in, in, in research, but we particularly need teams. And, and I think you will have, must appreciate by now that to make um, modern research work, it requires an immense effort by potentially very large teams dealing with large numbers of people with very big data sets. And so you've got the doctors up here, imaging specialists, those clinicians and physicists, uh, cell people, geneticists, research nurses organizing trials, bioinformaticians and statisticians uh, helping organize data and, and, and making sense of it, computer sciences on the hardware, device engineers about the engineering of remote medicine and so on, health economists to bring back this idea of affordability, project managers, and in particular, we need communicators. And, and that's why we feel that, that um, members of the uh, there should be some um, emphasis in these posters 
uh, on communication and, and that it would be helpful for uh, those with a science bent who may not feel that good at communicating and design to, to think about including in the team artists or designers, uh, um, students who, who might not be on the scientific track, who, who can get involved uh, and, and be part of the team. Just to, uh, oh, I, before I go on, I should also say that, that um, uh, this is uh, the idea that, uh, that we're basically very keen that, that teams should also, and, and medicine as a whole, should be diverse. And of course, gender equality now uh, is, is, is becoming taken for granted or has, is now taken for granted in medicine. We're very keen for, for, for um, women in science. Uh, I thought, thought you might like to see this, which someone gave me the other day. Uh, it's from 1963 when things were very different. Uh, this is an advert for Barclays Bank, a career in the bank for ambitious young men and there's scope for girls as well. And it's nothing like that anymore. So just to give you a taste then, I think lastly on, on this whole issue of communication, uh, really what we've got to do is not only make medicine um, attractive and um, uh, 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 we need people to, 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 to be on the same page as, 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 as the medical program, but, but we also want to fight off misinformation. So uh, this is Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner, of course, um, created a breakthrough uh, in the late 1700s when he, he invented vaccination. So before that, smallpox was, treated, was, was prevented rather dangerously by giving small doses of smallpox virus uh, to young, young, young children. Uh, and the idea was that the dose was very small and they didn't get serious disease. And sadly, they often did. And so there was quite a significant mortality from this preventive venture. Jenna uh, realized that milkmaids uh, actually seldom got smallpox. And the reason for that was because they got cowpox and cowpox protected them uh, from smallpox. So this in his portrait here, we see the cow origin of the vaccine inoculation. Now, this worked very well. And uh, I'll show you in a moment that it eradicated smallpox. It didn't go down well with many people at the time. So anti-vaxxers existed in the early 1800s. And, and here's uh, James Gilroy's caricature of, of anti-vaxxers who felt they were gonna get, um, become like cows uh, for being given uh, vaccination from cowpox. And then the old, the old, the guys who were giving the smallpox inoculations, they were disgusted and they had to be seen off as well. This, these are all the bodies that the uh, uh, smallpox inoculators uh, had left behind. In, in their vested interest in carrying on their trade when a better technique came in. Well, smallpox was eradicated globally in 1980 entirely by vaccination. Uh, and then, but, but anti-vaxxers have not gone away. Um, in 1930s, uh, poliomyelitis vaccine controversy delayed clinical trials for 20 years. And this virus, which caused uh, extremely serious neurological disablement, uh, is now 90% eradicated globally due to vaccination. However, claims that the MMR vaccine have caused autism uh, have led to a major reappearance in measles. Uh, and I don't have to tell you about the controversies about the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 vaccination program. And suffice it to say is, is, is that uh, I think most doctors would, would say that, that the, the uh, potential benefits very much outweigh the risks of vaccination. So there we are, that, that's the, the, the prize. Um, we want teams of no more than six members. Uh, the age and year of study of students is open. I actually, it did say earlier that, that it should be six formers, but we've changed that. Uh, we don't mind the age and year of, 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 year of study, but students still need to be at school. We want the, the, a diversity uh, of, of, uh, of abilities uh, in, in, in the teams. Uh, so they might be made up with strengths in biology, mass, computing, uh, particularly design and communication to make attractive uh, posters with, with hopefully original illustrations. Um, so each, each school or educational organization can submit one team. So it's up to the school how it chooses that team. Uh, and unfortunately at the moment, the, uh, this year we're, we're restricting it to United Kingdom schools. Um, if if the, the, the scheme goes well, we, we may rerun it, in which case we will consider extending it. But for this year, it's just United Kingdom schools. 
So um, on the website is a submission de uh, deadline. Uh, we will triage the uh, submissions and, and the top 10 teams will be invited to present their e-posters to a multidisciplinary audience who will vote on the, on, on the posters. Uh, I'm hoping that might be in person, but uh, let's not guarantee on that. It may just have to be online. So what's the poster going to look like? Well, this is a typical format of a conventional academic poster. You have a title at the top, authors, institutions, logo of the school or university, uh, abstract, introduction, data, discussion, contributions, references. But yours it doesn't need to look like that. Indeed, it can't look like that because you're not going to have any results. Uh, so really, your team is free to design these e-posters in any way it decides is best. But I, th I think, um, and we're not going to be prescriptive about this, but I, I think you, we certainly don't want you to try and cover the whole of, cardio of, of, of heart and circulatory medicine. I think you're going to need to fo focus on one aspect. I think you're going to need to define what you see as the, as the unmet need uh, that needs, needs better treatment or better care. Uh, work out um, the sort of research program, I think, that, that is going to enable you to come up with evidence uh, for a better system uh, and then how you're going to roll that out and make it acceptable uh, and a success uh, in treating patients um, say in the NHS but it could be globally I don't, it doesn't have to be just about this country so to summarize then uh, relatively few doctors are full-time clinical academics but all medicine has an academic component and nowadays all doctors are expected to maintain an academic interest through continuous medical education. Medicine is very important, is not just applied biology. Its success is always dependent on other sciences and computational sciences are becoming uh, exceptionally important today and in the future. So the digital age has transformed medical research and the practice of medicine. Uh, we invite you to, uh, looking forward to seeing your, the designs of your e-posters to outline how science applied to medicine will reduce heart and circulatory disease. So uh, that's it from me. Uh, good luck. And, and um, I, I can answer some questions. I think we've got time. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Um, if I can work out how to do that. Yeah, okay. brilliant. Thank you very much, Dorian. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, um, please feel free to pop them into the chat box now and we can uh, fire them um, at Dorian. We've got a question saying, will international schools who follow the UK curriculum be included in the competition or not? Well, sadly not. Um, so we thought long and hard about this and, and, and discussed it with the BHF as a national charity. And, and uh, this year, that, uh, unfortunately, it, 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 they're not allowed, to, they're, not, they're not invited. So um, as I said, we, we may uh, change that if we rerun it. But, but and so watch the space, but this year not. Um, and then we have, um, so for our strategy, do we need to create a long-term or a short-term strategy? Um, I think um, it's really up to you, but I, I think if it were me, uh, I, I would certainly want a short-term strategy, but vision on how it could be extended into the long-term. Um, so, um, I mean, things change. And, and, and uh, I, I would have thought that a strategy that for 10 years or 20 years would be quite adequate. I, would, I, don't, think, I don't think you should be thinking beyond that. But, but I think a strategy that's realistic and, and, and very importantly, it needs to be based on realistic science and engineering. Uh, I, I think um, science fiction is, 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 is not wise. Yeah. And I guess, like you said, if you look at the developments that have happened, even, you know, in the last 50 years, we can't really think ahead any further than that, because who knows where we'll be in terms of developments then? Well, developments, uh, I mean, technology um, happens before its applications often, doesn't it? And so, I mean, I think we've got a toolbox here with, with, with digital technology, uh, the sort of things I've been talking about. And I think we're just scraping the surface on what can be done with it. So, so I, I think if it were me, that's the sort of thing I would, I would be looking at. But uh, really, we're, we're, I'm not giving you the answers because partly because we don't know the answers. And, but most importantly, because we want you to think about it and, and, and 
come up with your own visions, which I think are going to be very exciting. Uh, we're really, we're really, really looking forward to seeing what you come up with. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so a few questions just in terms of the content of the posters. So someone asking, do they need to use original illustrations um, or are they able to use sort of pre-made images that they've found? Yeah, so, so actually this is, this is covered on the website. Um, I, I think we will give, a ver those that provide it, original illustrations will be at an advantage. Uh, I think that um, simply downloading images from the web is, is not really what we're, we're, we're thinking of. And, and that's one of the reasons why design and, and, and um, sort of artistic uh, team members could, could come in handy. Uh, we're not expecting you to have uh, high tech uh, gear for creating images. Uh, so, some, I mean, really, it's the ideas that are more important that, that, than uh, anything that's glossy. So, um, you know, if you haven't got a program to, 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 to create nice images, just draw them and, th and then photograph them with your iPhone or, or your, your cell phone and, and cut and paste. You know, I, I think there is going to be a, it's going to be a, a question on, on the submission form um, asking if, if the, there are any technical difficulties in 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 assembling the, the poster and and if if you had problems in that regard please put them and we will definitely uh, take that into account but we we don't want hardware computer hardware or computer software to be ruling this it's about your ideas and and just have the ideas and and, and communicate them as best you can um, and then we have a couple of questions saying, do they need to design a product as such or more of just a strategy that sort of- could be either. I, I, I think it could be either. Yeah. Um, that's open. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think, we, we won't mind which it is. Yeah. Um, and then there's a couple of questions. So looking at how the posters are assessed and, the way to sort of maximize success, I guess, um, in the project. I don't know how much you can yeah, get so, that, really. I mean, it's going to be very tough to assess these. Uh, um, so I think we'll be looking for, there is also going to be a question about how the team has worked, uh, what the composition of the team was. And, and we want to see evidence of, 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 um, of, of uh, a, um, if you like, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we did, uh, so that that will score, um, but I, I, I think a, a, just original ideas and and good design of the poster are really what we're, we're after. I think I saw in the chat someone asking there has to be uh, have you, if you have if, if you have to present research. No, clearly not. I'm, you're not in a position to do research. So I, 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 that's not on the cards at all. This this is about vision of of, of how science might be unrolled might unroll uh, for the benefit of patients in, over the next 20, 25 years. Brilliant. Um, and then, so we have a question saying, could you possibly advise how much of the poster should be retrospective and how much should be forward looking and aiming to propose strategies and protocols for future work? Yes, I, I, I think that um, there has to, I think that, that um, you, you probably want to have a, a component of um, setting the problem, um, a component on current practice, uh, a component on how current practice doesn't actually meet the need, in other words, the unmet need, and, and then move on to how you see that unmet need being met. Okay. Um... So, so do we have to have evidence as to how something could be coded or can we vaguely explain what our vision is? How it, so I think they're sort of asking how in depth do they need to go into their vision or their sort of strategy? Um, uh, I, I think the expression here is that uh, don't lose sight of the wood for the trees. So, so I think there needs to be some detail, but, but the, the, the overall vision needs to come through very clearly. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, so we've kind of said, so do we give details on existing strategies? I guess we've kind of covered that by saying, sort of summarizing what's already in place and kind of what's lacking and therefore how their innovative strategies will come in. Um, so someone's asked, so essentially the e-poster would hypothesize the type of treatments developed. Oh, questions keep coming in and moving the <laughs> ones that I'm reading. Uh, e-poster would hypothesize the types of treatments developing within technology. Um, I'm not quite sure what that one means. Um, I mean, while you're while you're reading that, uh, I, I just caught one which met my eye. I thought was was yeah. an important question, which was uh, wh whether w it has to be about UK health or, or could be about global health. Mm -hmm. uh, either is fine. Uh, I, actually, I think we'd be very interested in global health. Um, absolutely fine, because uh, it may not be one size fits all. Uh, and and if you want to do something on um, heart disease in, 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 in um, developing economies, that kind of thing, that, that, that would be very interesting. So, so no, it not, doesn't have to be just about the UK. Brilliant. Um, and I think there's sort of, there's a few sort of questions which are kind of centered around the same kind of point. So do you want them to come up with their own innovative strategies or just build on what's already out there? No, I, 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 I mean, yes, is the answer. I, I, I don't think we want just a summary of what's being done. Um, I, I think we want to have some forward thinking. Uh, just a review of what's available um, and being done. Um, I mean, it would be worthwhile to do and you'll learn a lot, but I don't, I don't think that's quite what we've got in mind. Um... Are we able to focus on just one type of CVD? Uh, yes, is the answer. Uh, so I, I think that um, I strongly recommend a focus, actually. You, you, you can't take everything on. And, and so it's not in, we're not in expecting you to, you know, take on stroke and heart attacks at the same time. You know, it's fine to focus. Um, however much you want to focus is fine. So if you, even if you want to take on some condition that's quite rare, um, as, as long as you've got presenting a strategy for improving the situation, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Um, and then I've got one that's been sent sort of directly in. So in when it comes to assessing the posters, how much weight will be given to the presentation of, the, of ideas versus the ideas themselves? Um, <laughs> uh, I think the ideas are the most important, but, but there the will be a waiting for the presentation. Yeah. That's where the communication. So, so I think I haven't said this, and, and no one seems to have asked it. But, but the, there is the key question on who's it all for, and 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 who who is the intended person, who is expected to read this poster, other than us judges. Uh, and I would suggest that you should pitch it at your 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 school friends, uh, at um, particularly ones not in not in science. Uh, so pitch it at, at, at a general audience um, and for that that's where the communication comes in and, and, and the importance of design uh, it, it's to catch catch people who might not be bothered to read it but who, who want to see it because it looks interesting uh, and is presented in an attractive manner uh, and in a way that delivers the information in an accessible form so um, that's the whole point, really, of, 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 of the, 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 the teams, including uh, people on the arts track. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think, unless, it, it, if I haven't answered, how do you intend a general audience benefit from understanding the strategies? What do we mean? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. No, I'm, I'm not sure I do either. Could, 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 could whoever asked that try and rephrase it? Clarify, yeah. It's a good question, but I just don't yeah. quite know how to answer it. Okay, yeah, they're, they're rephrasing it. Yeah. 
Um, if anyone Sorry, else, if I, I haven't, I, if I've I, missed I, your question and we haven't asked it, just resend it just because we've had quite a few come in. So if uh, yeah. so, if someone's asked if there's any specific. So in this case, uh, absolutely not. And, and I, I don't want you to worry too much about the software. Um, particularly, it's not necessary to be spending money on new software. So, so um, just do what you can with what's available and, and outline what sort of software you've got in, in, the, um, in the submission um, thing. There was a question for that and whether, what sort of technical challenges you had. But, but certainly don't think you're going to be at a disadvantage because you haven't got some fancy expensive software. Uh, I think that's a very important point. Mm -hmm. the strategies are going to be implemented by public health organizations how will the average can't see the rest of that so how will the average member of the public benefit from knowing about and understanding the strategies of reducing heart disease other than the most common ones well i think that's exactly the challenge isn't it it, 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 it is is an educational challenge for, for for the public to get a bit beyond the these these obvious things um and to um Kind of think in terms of how, how, how you get uptake by, by the public of, of new things you might want to do. So, I mean, I, I think an example would be, you know, going back to the um, Internet of Things um, slide I showed you uh, and having all these devices in the home. I mean, that, that could cause a lot of pushback in terms of people thinking that Big Brother's uh, looking at them all the time and, and, and uh, they're losing their independence and, and, and their privacy. So I think that um, you know having that kind of in what you might call emotional intelligence to 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 actually realize the way in which people might see these things uh, and incorporate that in 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 your design so that someone reading this uh, will immediately say to themselves, "God, that looks good," rather than, "Wow, it's just the state on me yet again." Uh, so you know that's the sort of example I give you. So I, I think that. Um, uh design it it's not to be just it isn't don't design your posters for doctors to look at they're for, for for public people to look at yeah i think from a from a clinical perspective when you get patients who come in and you tell them about how they can reduce their risk of of heart disease they seem to know all the risks and yet they don't implement them so it's it's kind of needing that fresh approach and something different for them well motivation is also an extremely important yeah. issue isn't it mm -hmm. So, so you, know, <laughs> you could do a post on how you motivate people. Yeah. Um, so someone's asked if there are any existing posters that they can take inspiration from. No, you're going to be the you're going to be the the, the, um, the template for that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 we're very keen not to give you the answers here. Uh, yeah. The whole point is that you come up with vision. Yeah. And then and, there's a couple. There's a couple asking if they can get help from teachers, or if there's anyone they can speak to for advice or guidance. Well, you can set. There is. A, there is a. Uh, if you go onto our website, um, uh, they have the link. Do they? Uh, they um, yes. Yeah, I think you. They should do. Yeah. Well, if you go onto Imperial College Centre of Excellence (BHF) and, and you go into community projects, and, and then the, the details are there, and and uh, there is a. Uh, an email address that you can email. In fact, I answer those emails. So, so just email me, and and um, uh, I'll do my best to to uh, address your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So we've got the last the last couple. Um, so one person asking about if it's about if the, their innovations are about treatment or prevention. Um, again, just choose something to focus on. Yeah. So it could be could be either, I guess. Yeah. Um, do you want them referencing if they've used academic sources? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I think um, a limited number of references would, would be would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but not an extensive reference list. No. Um, OK, um, and then the last one. So someone's saying, so should we imagine this being hung up in a GP practice for the general public to see? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Great question. OK, I and actually, I think the BHF is, is, is going to invite the, 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 uh, 
I think it's the winning three. I, I forget the exact number uh, to, to write for their blog. Oh, so there's going to be opportunities coming in uh, for, for, the, for the successful ones. Yeah, that's brilliant as well. If you if anyone here is wanting to apply for medical school, having that on your CV is incredible. Um, I think, I, I mean, I'd further than that set to say that, that actually, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about whether you win or lose ultimately. Just doing yeah. going through the experience and it gives you something to talk about, to write yeah. on your personal statement, to, to um, talk about if, if the opportunity comes up at interviews. Yeah. Uh, you know, you'll go in there and there's knowing that much more about things. And, and so I think it's a very good preparation uh, uh, for getting into university and, and in particular medical school. So I, 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 please, please don't think that you've lost if you don't get one of the prizes. Uh, yeah. it, it's really the experience that we're interested in people having. Yeah, I had a, I had a quick question before we, before we finish, actually, just from your perspective. Um, a lot of the um, sort of academic clinicians that I speak to now believe that in the UK we should kind of follow a similar model to other countries and that you should do sort of either biomedical sciences or some kind of pre-medical degree um, before entering into sort of clinical medicine to increase exposure to sort of medical research and the importance of it. I just wondered what your, your stance was on that. Well, I guess that depends. I mean, of course, many, many, many medical schools embed a, 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 the BSc uh, in a compulsory way. But in Imperial College, you have to do a year. Mm. I think the thing would be true of several universities. Um, I mean, I think that that opportunity exists in most universities, but isn't necessarily taken up. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's a very good question. And, and um, it is important that, that medicine doesn't lose sight of science and, and, and doesn't lose sight of participation in, in, in research. Um, there is a political agenda whereby doctors just become operatives uh, and in, 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 in terms of providing you know, hard graft treatment of patients. Mm. But I think if, if you don't have that background of, of understanding disease and understanding um, the basis of treatment and so on, then uh, I think that becomes very difficult to sustain. Uh, people get find it very difficult to continue in the job if, if, if you don't have that, that, that educational background. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, I think that, 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 that um, actually the NHS has been very successful at integrating research in, 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 into routine care. Uh, and I think Sally Davis's efforts to to, to with the NIHR to, to um, fund research within the NHS on relevant questions for the NHS has been absolutely outstanding. And, and you know, I think we've seen through the COVID crisis that, that actually we've, the UK has been extremely quick off the mark by, by having a very robust infrastructure to do research in, 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 on clinical matters. And I think we're very lucky in that respect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think we need, definitely need to sustain our um, knowledge and understanding base uh, at a scientific level. Brilliant. Okay, well, I think that concludes everything. Like you said, if, if people do have questions later on, they can, they can obviously get in touch. And there's a lot of information on the website um, regarding the competition. So if people do have sort of any further questions, then there is, you know, you don't have to just sit in silence, you can get in contact and, and and, uh, and get the answers to them. I'm just looking at if, if Ahmed's question on on on, on um, oh yeah factoring in costs. I think that'd be a good idea. Uh, I'm a big believer in making medicines affordable. Yeah, definitely a good idea. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much uh, to Dorian and thank you to everyone for coming this evening and and sort of tuning in and asking lots of questions um and yeah i think that's um that's everything from us well thank thanks for hosting much. us and, and uh uh good luck i hope it goes well yeah okay. best of luck with everyone okay bye bye see you later everyone thanks